Hello and welcome. I'm Adele Gautier from Breast Cancer Foundation NZ. And tonight we're talking about fertility after breast cancer. Before we get started, some housekeeping. If you have any technical issues, there's a box at the right hand at the bottom left of your screen with a um, phone number and you can put your passcode in there, which is also on the screen, and talk to the tech team or type details of your problem in the chat box and the support team will get in touch. If you have any sound problems, you might prefer to listen on your phone while watching on your computer. You can see some instructions for how to do that on the bottom of your screen. You can use the chat box during the webinar to ask questions, which hopefully we'll get to later. And you can also chat to other people there. Don't worry about missing out on information while you're chatting. The webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website in a few days' time. We have three panellists tonight we're going to share with you. Caroline was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2011 and she is 33 years old. Dr. Sheridan Wilson is an oncologist and Dr. Guy Goodex is a gynecologist and fertility specialist. First we're going to hear from Caroline. Caroline, thanks so much for being here tonight and for being willing to share what's really a deeply personal experience for you. I'm just going to let you get started and tell us your story. Hi, my name is Caroline Eric. In September 2011, I was diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer. I was 33 years old at the time, had no family history of any sort of cancer, and I don't have the BRCA gene. So the cause of my cancer is still unknown. To say that the cancer diagnosis was a bit of a shock uh, would be an understatement. My husband and I were beyond shocked. We were referred to Auckland Hospital and an oncologist called Dr. David Porter. At the very first appointment with Dr. Porter, he discussed fertility preservation with us. At that stage, we didn't have any children, but we did want to have a family and in fact been trying to get pregnant. Dr. Porter talked to us about a trial drug uh, that could potentially protect the ovaries from the effects of chemotherapy. And he also talked to us about IVF treatment and the freezing of embryos. It was um, so important to us that Dr. Porter understood the importance of fertility preservation not just because of our age, but that this was something that was very important to us, not having any children at that point in time. And I'll personally be forever grateful that this discussion took place and that he did consider that uh, element to my life beyond cancer. So both of the options that had been discussed, my husband and I decided to go ahead with, uh, both the trial drug and IVF treatment. I was referred to a fertility clinic and given three weeks to complete my uh, IVF treatment. This was because my cancer was considered aggressive and had been detected uh, somewhat late due to other circumstances which I wouldn't go into today. So I was referred over to the fertility clinic and the first step was to have a blood test taken. This was to check the level of my egg reserves, which I understand correlates to fertility in the sense that the more eggs you have, uh, the more fertile you are, but that they are not able to tell from this the quality of the eggs themselves. My test results came back about average. And so we moved forward to the IVF treatment. This involved uh, hormone injections, daily injections, blood tests, scans, the collection of four eggs, and finally the freezing of three healthy embryos. So although I'm told that four eggs is not a great uh, number to, to get through the process, being able to have three of those four eggs turn into healthy frozen embryos was actually a really great result. I would say that the process of IVF was a lot less daunting than what I had imagined and uh, what I'd heard about 
from from just discussions with people indirectly beforehand. Um, and the injections weren't painful in my experience. So it was actually a lot easier process than what I thought it may have been. The actual hardest part of the process was really waiting for the eggs to successfully fertilise and to progress to the point where they were able to be frozen. That was the part where we, well, my husband and I really held our breath and hoped for the best. Once we had our uh, three frozen embryos, we felt really secure in the in the fact that we would most likely be able to have a family, one child hopefully at least, possibly maybe more. So then we returned to Auckland Hospital for treatment and my treatment included three months of chemotherapy, a mastectomy and radiation treatment. The chemotherapy was actually very effective in my case. The cancer being aggressive meant that the chemotherapy was effective. So the lump disappeared entirely, but I was strongly recommended to continue with the other treatments. And uh, the uh, radiation was actually sold to me as an insurance policy on the top. And being a very cautious individual, I thought that I would buy that policy, and so went ahead. My treatments took about nine months or so, and I had completed them by June 2012. So at that point, my thoughts turned back immediately to having a family and the frozen embryos. So I went back to see Dr. Porter, or my husband and I did, and discussed um, when these embryos could be used. Dr. Porter recommended that we wait two years before trying to get pregnant because that was the period within which the cancer was most likely to return if it was going to do so. So my husband and I thought about it and ultimately decided that we couldn't wait two years and about a year later decided to go ahead uh, with the second part of the IVF treatment, which was the replacement of the embryos. So... We went back to the fertility clinic and again went through the process of having a blood test done. This time the blood test showed that my fertility had been significantly impacted and my egg reserves were significantly reduced. That was really disappointing but um, I had these frozen embryos and so we went ahead and, and used those and, and put the fertility uh, issues to one side otherwise. So we used the first embryo and it didn't take. Um, then we used the second one and unfortunately that one didn't thaw. So that morning it was a very difficult decision to make whether we used the third and final, final embryo but we decided to do so and that little embryo was now our beautiful three-year-old daughter. So a really great result from that one cycle of IVF treatment. Um, I would say the hardest thing at that point was waiting for the pregnancy results to come through and um, just having that final result being positive was just fantastic. Um, so I had my daughter. A couple of years later, my husband and I decided that we'd like to try and have another child. We tried natural conception. We tried uh, naturopath remedies, etc., just for a few months. Um, and it just wasn't successful. So we went back to the fertility clinic and decided to do a second round of IVF treatment. Again, we had our, well, I had my rather egg reserves tested. And at that point, I was basically off the charts. My reserves were so low that I was below the level that they actually test for. So very disappointing but uh, my husband and I decided that we had to give it a try and see, see where we get. So we knew there were slim chances, but we went into it realistic and uh, managed to get two eggs, of which uh, one became a frozen embryo, and that uh, embryo was later used. Um, it was unsuccessful, and obviously that was a, a really difficult and disappointing result to get. And at that point, we just had to consider whether we were going to continue and try a third cycle or not. We decided um, after 
you know, given the information that we had and after the discussions we'd had with the doctors, that it wouldn't really be sensible to try again. So that was the end of our IVF road. Um, the process itself had been um, a, an expensive process. It had been emotionally difficult and I'd actually felt at times like I was just just a number. Uh, yet another um, person um, with fertility issues. So difficult process and just didn't really seem sensible to try again. So my husband and I are now uh, looking at other options. We're considering adoption. We're considering uh, home for life, which is another alternative option to adoption. And um, it's another lengthy and emotional process but one that we think is, is well worth trying. Um, we're also adapting in the meantime to being a family of three. Um, I would say probably that the most significant impact from having had cancer is actually the impact that it's had on my fertility. I had developed coping mechanisms for dealing with the treatments and surgery and scars, etc., but I hadn't really... I hadn't really appreciated the uh, prospect of long-term impact on fertility. So that was definitely the most difficult outcome from having experienced cancer. I would say that probably my advice to those going through it would be when you see your oncologist, make sure they discuss fertility preservation options with you. And if they don't, or if you don't feel comfortable with them, uh, ask around and find somebody else that you are comfortable with. Even in the public system, you have an opportunity to find someone that you can talk with and be comfortable. Again, the same when you're going through fertility treatment. Make sure you're comfortable with not only the clinic, but the people that you are dealing with there, um, that you have a doctor who's available and empathetic and that you're just comfortable with because even in the public system you can change doctors if you need to. Um, so I hope that my um, story today has been helpful and thank you for listening. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here to discuss this very important topic tonight. Um, we know that a number of women who are diagnosed with breast cancer have not completed their family yet, and Caroline's story illustrates that very well. In New Zealand, just over 10% of breast cancers are diagnosed in women who are aged less than 45, and breast cancer remains the most common cancer diagnosed in women of reproductive age. There's a new term called oncofertility, and that's really what we're here discussing tonight. And I'm reassured that there's a term which now describes the challenges that some young people have when they're faced with a cancer diagnosis. They're offered potentially life-saving treatment, but this, that this treatment can also be fertility threatening. And there are a number of controversial issues around pregnancy after a breast cancer diagnosis. And I accept that there has been a lack of consistent advice in this space as well. So what do I think you should be discussing when the topic of fertility is raised with your oncologist? I think there are four key issues that need to be addressed. The first and arguably the most important issue is how your breast cancer treatment is going to impact on your fertility. The other question is to canvas your oncologist about what advice they have in trying for a future pregnancy. Do they think that it's safe in your case? You should also be looking for some advice around fertility preservation and checking whether it's appropriate to be referred to a fertility specialist to explore some options further. And finally, I think you should be clear about what the timeline for your treatment is so that you can look at when pregnancy options might appear in the future for you. So let's chat a little about um, how breast cancer treatment does impact on your fertility. And the key culprit here are the drugs that we use. Many young women with a breast cancer diagnosis will be recommended a course of chemotherapy. 
and we know that chemotherapy can damage ovaries. It does this in a number of ways, partly by damaging the small blood vessels that supply the ovaries, and partly by inducing the death of some of the follicles, which are the early immature eggs that are ultimately released by the ovaries. Even in women who continue to have periods throughout chemotherapy, this damage is occurring. So for young women who may not um, experience ovarian failure during chemotherapy, they are still destined for an earlier menopause, which means an earlier loss of their fertility window. With each cycle of chemotherapy, there's a, a loss of a fraction of the ovarian reserve, and this is effectively the number of eggs that are remaining in the ovary. For a younger woman, there is a larger ovarian reserve, and so they have some more of a buffer to tolerate those losses. Um, again, they might not experience chemotherapy-induced amenorrhea, but they are destined for an earlier loss of fertility. The risk of chemotherapy-induced amenorrhea, which is the loss of your periods during chemotherapy, is quite closely related to a woman's age. So the closer you are to a natural menopause, the more likely it is that chemotherapy will lead to a premature and permanent menopause. Other influences on the likelihood of developing chemotherapy-associated amenorrhea include the type of chemotherapy drug that's used and the total number of cycles that are, that are given. On the next slide, there's a table which is busy, but what this does is summarizes the most recent and comprehensive assessment of chemotherapy-associated amenorrhea. And you can see that for women under 35, there is a relatively lowered risk of loss of periods with chemotherapy, irrespective of the drugs that are used and the number of cycles. And I say relatively because it's true that up to one in four women in this age group will still have significant impairment of their fertility. In the 35 to 40 year old age group, there's a much stronger interplay between the type of chemotherapy drugs and the number of chemotherapy treatments that are being given. The other drugs that we use are the hormone or endocrine therapies, and this includes agents such as tamoxifen, which many of you will be familiar with, and the aromatase inhibitors, which are generally given alongside ovarian function suppression. Now, these drugs aren't safe during pregnancy, and um, you may be prescribed five or even ten years of these treatments. So the way that they impact on fertility is by delaying the opportunity for conception. So this is a more indirect impact on fertility. The third drug that we use commonly in breast cancer is perceptin. Um, this probably doesn't have any specific damaging effect on ovaries, but it is frequently prescribed for a year, which means it also leads to a delay in the opportunity for conception. But the other issue to discuss with your oncologist is the safety of pregnancy after a breast cancer diagnosis. And there has been a historical concern that some of the hormonal changes associated with, with pregnancy might actually promote a breast cancer recurrence. It's very difficult to do the right kind of scientific study to put this concern to rest because you can't simply allocate a group of women to pregnancy and allocate, allocate another group of women to not have a pregnancy. Instead, you have to look at large case series or breast cancer registry data and try and tease out the impact that pregnancy has on breast cancer outcome. And this has been done in a number of studies. Uh, the one on the slide that's now shown looked at 333 women and compared their breast cancer outcome with 874 women who did not achieve pregnancy. So the 333 women were, were women who uh, became pregnant after breast cancer. And they matched these two groups according to their age, uh, the kind of treatment that they received, and their tumor characteristics. And what they found is that there was no significant difference in survival between the group who achieved a pregnancy and the group who did not. There's another larger study out of Canada that looked at more than 7,000 women, and they found a similar result, that there didn't seem to be a negative impact from pregnancy occurring after a breast cancer diagnosis. 
So I think that these two studies do underscore the safety of pregnancy following breast cancer, and I, and I firmly believe that pregnancy shouldn't be discouraged in women who have had a breast cancer diagnosis. So if we accept that pregnancy following a breast cancer diagnosis is a safe option, and we accept that chemotherapy might adversely impact on fertility, what can we do to help minimize this impact? One option is to try and protect the ovaries during chemotherapy. We do this with drugs such as gozerelin, which you may know as Zolodex. This is an injected hormone that tricks your ovaries into a temporary resting state. The idea here is that if the ovaries are not doing their normal cycling during chemotherapy, they're less vulnerable to the damaging effects of chemotherapy. In the earlier studies looking at the use of Zolodex type drugs, the results were a little inconsistent. But in recent times, we've got two large studies, the PROMISE trial and the POEMS study, which show us that using the Zolodex type of drug can reduce the likelihood of losing your periods with chemotherapy. The key question is, if this happens, does it actually result in more pregnancies? And it's a bit tricky to say for sure. Superficially, it looks like it does, but the actual numbers of pregnancies that have been achieved both in women who received the Zolodex type of injection and in the groups that didn't. These numbers are really low. So it's hard to say with confidence that this is effective in leading to a higher number of pregnancies. And it certainly shouldn't be considered an alternative to the assisted reproduction techniques that we'll hear about from Guy. So with respect to uh, the safety or, or assisted reproduction, um, historically the concerns were the ovarian stimulation that might be occurring uh, as part of your fertility treatment would lead to a delay in commencing chemotherapy. Um, but there are some new techniques which can help minimize the time required, and I'm sure we'll hear more about that. The other concern for oncologists was the theoretical risk that the rise in hormone levels, which occurs with ovarian stimulation, might actually promote cancer cell growth and lead to worse breast cancer outcomes. The good news is that there are now fertility techniques which minimize this rise in hormone levels. And in support of this, there have been a number of studies published which look at breast cancer outcomes amongst women who have had ovarian stimulation. And it looks very much, although the evidence is limited, uh, that receiving ovarian stimulation to assist fertility does not negatively impact on breast cancer outcomes. The final thing to talk about is interruption of hormone therapy. Um, the feasibility of becoming pregnant after five or ten years of hormone therapy is a real challenge. And so there's been an idea that perhaps interrupting your hormone therapy may be an opportunity to try for a pregnancy. There is a large study underway at the moment called, called the Positive Trial, which is uh, looking at exactly this. Women who interrupt their tamoxifen for up to two years to try for a pregnancy. And in the long term, we'll have a better understanding of whether this kind of interruption does impact on breast cancer outcome. At the, mo at the moment, we simply don't know. So the advice is to take an individualized approach where your oncologist will look at your breast cancer risk factors and help uh, you to look at your fertility um, opportunities as well and make a decision about interrupting endocrine therapy. So in summary, I think um, you know, oncologic fertility is an incredibly important topic because a number of women will be diagnosed and receive breast cancer treatment before they've completed their families. We do know now that breast cancer, sorry, that pregnancy after a breast cancer diagnosis is safe. We're not really sure what the optimal time of this is. Equally, we're not sure about the safety of interrupting hormone therapy, and I recommend that an individualized approach is taken in discussion with your oncologist. Um, finally, it certainly looks that for breast cancer patients, pursuing fertility intervention is a safe uh, thing to do. Yeah.
and um, I guess we'll get in line now about those facility interventions. Great, thank you, Shannon. So our last speaker is Guy Gillette, gynecologist and fertility specialist, and also the medical director of VicproMed, one of the three organisations providing publicly funded fertility treatments to Auckland breast cancer patients. Guy, what are the options for women before and after breast cancer, and how do they choose? Thanks very much. Um, it's a very important subject, and um, as Sheridan's mentioned, about 10% of the cases of um, breast cancer diagnosed each year are in the age group of under 40 to 45. So reproduction and the issue of having children is going to be important for some of those patients. As an example, I've treated a couple of patients earlier this year wanting fertility preservation who have been in their 20s. Um, and that was several years before they even considered um, thinking about planning for, for children. Another important issue is that certainly New Zealand and other developed countries in the last 10 to 15 years, there's been a tendency towards putting off having a first child, um, sometimes well into their 30s. And about a quarter of babies now in New Zealand are born to women um, in the 35 to 40 age group. So I think it's really important that um, just as we teach our teenagers about contraception and about um, you know, reproductive health, that we also have a conversation with them about a varying age and, and egg reserves, and when's a good time to, um, to plan for children. It's really important to remember that the number of eggs that a woman has is fixed. She's born probably with about two million, and it's rather scary to think that by the time your first period comes, um, you're probably down to less than one million. So you've lost half of your eggs even before you've started having periods. And being on the pill, which stops you from ovulating, doesn't protect your egg reserves. So you do eggs each month, lots and lots of them, um, whether you're uh, on the pill or not. One of the really hugely um, useful things in, in my work that's happened in the last um, five to ten years is the development of a blood test called AMH. And the next slide shows a graph that we use to plot a woman's AMH. It allows us to really accurately predict what the current ovarian reserve is, and probably, particularly if we can get one um, maybe six months or 12 months apart, predict also the, the rate of decline, and probably will be used in the future to, to predict um, fairly accurately the age of the onset of menopause. The blood test isn't free, it's about $65 to $70. Um, and unfortunately it's not free for anyone, but it's an incredibly useful test to allow us to give really sensible advice to people about both what their chances are and helping manage expectations around how many eggs they're likely to get. Um, if they do fertility preservation options. I'm going to cover off a couple of the most common fertility preservation options. Um, Sheridan's already mentioned about um, going on to a drug to suppress the ovaries. Um, many patients will choose to do that, and even though the evidence isn't absolutely clear for how helpful it is, we also know that it's extremely safe. Um, and apart from some side effects like um, temporary hot flushes for a while, um, it's generally very well tolerated. Getting embryo freezing are the two most commonly used options, and I'm not going to really spend any more time talking about ovarian tissue freezing and immature egg retrieval, which are done in, in very occasional cases, um, but are still viewed as experimental to some degree, and it's egg and embryo freezing that really gives us the greatest opportunity to, um, to preserve, preserve fertility. There's a very good system um, through the public um, funding if you're eligible, I'll touch about el on eligibility in a minute. We can usually see you within one to two days of you being referred. And it's important to remember that the team that will see you is multidisciplinary. So in addition to seeing um, a fertility specialist like me, you also see one of our nurse specialists. Counselors are an integral part of our team, and they have a very important job in implications counselling. Um, people who have just recently been diagnosed with cancer often um, full of questions, as you can understand, particularly about reproduction. Um, and we also have, um, obviously, our laboratory staff. Egg freezing has developed hugely in the last four to five years and is now as good as freezing embryos. So the old way we used to do it, eggs weren't quite as robust and the wasn't as, as good a survival after falling. But with the new, what we call, stack freezing or liquefaction, We've really got similar chances of having a baby after either egg or embryo freezing. 
And obviously, if you're single, we're not in a position to want to fertilise eggs. Um, egg freezing is a very good option. I think the other thing that I can reassure you about, and, and Caroline has touched on this, is that although IVF does seem a bit scary, uh, it's changed hugely in the last decade. It's hugely shorter. And although we prefer to start um, during someone's period, um, we can also start, if we have to, with cycle. And it can be all over in about 10 days from start to finish. The injections are each day, and they're a very simple pen, a little bit like an insulin injection. But we also have a very clever injection that lasts a week if people don't particularly like needles. A um, couple of ultrasound scans. And the slide that I'm going to show you next actually just shows you what a stimulated ovary looks like. Um, after someone's taken injections for seven or eight days. And so the, the um, so-called bunch of grapes picture is really just a whole lot of follicles and a stimulated ovary. And from each of those, we'll put a needle in and suck out an egg, hopefully. The average number of eggs we get is about seven to ten. Again, to reassure you that the egg harvest process is actually quite simple. It takes about a quarter of an hour. You stay about an hour afterwards and, and just wake up after some light sedation. And it's low, done with local anaesthetic with very fine needles. So in fact, most people find it really, very comfortable. Um, and it's really, um, really equivalent to having a vaginal ultrasound skin. When we've got the eggs, we then freeze them. This next slide shows you a process called ICSI. And this is actually how we fertilize the eggs, either when we unfreeze them a year or two later, or if we're going to fertilize them at the time, we do ICSI about half the time. You can see a needle on the right coming in, and that, that round thing is the egg that's been stabilised by the pipette. And we'll do this particularly when we think this is sperm issue and we're worried about fertilisation. Next slide, please. In terms of public funding, um, there is a good service available, but unfortunately there are some restrictions. Um, the woman has to be under the age of 40 to be eligible. And you also have to have no biological children. So that can be actually quite a tough role if you say you had a child in a previous relationship, but you don't have any in this relationship. So at the moment, if you do have children, you, you won't be eligible. And you unfortunately also have to be a, have a BMI of under 32. And that's partly to do with how you respond to drugs. Next slide, thanks. I want to mention about egg donation because egg donation is going to be a really important option for some patients. As we've already heard about, the chemotherapy may impact very significantly on a very reserve, um, and the periods may not return, suggesting that um, the egg reserve is extremely low. And the AMH level can um, decline and become undetectable. So we know that those patients, if they're not having periods, are not going to respond to the drugs that we use for IVF. Egg donation is done reasonably commonly in New Zealand, and the big problem we have is, is finding donors. So some patients are travelling overseas, and other patients are obviously using someone within their community. It might be a younger family member, it might be a friend. The ideal egg donor would be under the age of 30, um, but we actually take egg donors under the age of 35 if their AMH seems good. There is legislation in New Zealand that covers um, egg donation, and certainly donors have to be identifiable. And we also have an upper age limit of around 50 to 52 in New Zealand, um, generally for using the uh, donor egg. And that's really around the, the risk of being pregnant um, when you get into your 50s. Um, it's not set in absolute concrete, but it's a, it's a general policy that most of the products um, adopt. And we'll, we'll take each case um, uh, individually. We'll, we'll assess them and look for other conditions such as diabetes and and heart problems and blood pressure problems and make individual decisions. I want to finish off by just commenting on our ability now to um, genetically test embryos. So these are fertilised eggs that have been frozen at the fifth day. And prior to freezing them, we can now take a little biopsy. And I've got a, um, a little brief video that shows the biopsy process. It doesn't harm the embryo. And what we're taking is actually just a little piece of the tissue that's come out of the side of the embryo naturally. And this is able to be replicated and genetically tested and give us exactly the genetic information of that embryo. And the huge advantage of this for the future will be that we can actually put back an embryo that's already been tested and made, made sure that it's got the right balanced number of chromosomes. 
we know then that the chance of getting pregnant is even better, and the chance of a miscarriage is quite low. But it can be absolutely devastating, as you can imagine, to get pregnant through treatments such as IVF and then have a miscarriage. At the moment, um, a frozen embryo being put back has about a 50% chance of getting um, somebody pregnant, and we would generally quote about a 90 to 95% chance of, it, of surviving the fall. We also know that freezing the embryos doesn't harm them, so there's no increased risk of um, problems with babies um, from embryos that have been frozen, so that's, that's very reassuring. We can test embryos. We have the technology to test embryos for um, the BRCA gene mutation, but that is controversial and there's some, certainly some ethical issues around that because at the end of the day, that would be an embryo that simply has a risk of something and not a definite diagnosis. I just want to finish off by um, saying in summary that counselling and early referral are really important parts of, um, of the fertility preservation journey. Um, ovarian reserve testing, primarily by way of AMH, is incredibly important um, and very useful. We can get the result back within a few days of having the blood test taken. Even embryo freezing is relatively simple and safe, and hopefully um, you'll be largely eligible for public funding. And as Sheridan's um, reiterated, it, it appears that generally pregnancy, um, breastfeeding, and assisted reproduction techniques um, are safe to do after a diagnosis of breast cancer. Thank you. Great, thank you Guy, that was very helpful and thanks so much to all three of you. We're now going to open up to some questions from you guys at home. Um, you can type questions in the box to the bottom left of the screen and we'll get through as many as we can in the time available. And can I have a question? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Guy, I'm anticipating now that some of the women who come and see me in the coming week might ask about AMH levels and do you recommend that this is a test which is overseen by a facility specialist uh, so that it can be interpreted in a helpful way? Generally, uh, I mean, we have graphs on our website um, where you can plot your results and see whether you fit into the low reserve um, area or the, or the average reserve area. But often the story is a little bit more complicated than that. And so to be able to benchmark it against how long has a, um, a person been trying to get pregnant, um, any other medical issues. So generally speaking, although general practitioners um, and non-fertility doctors can request the test, it's often helpful to have a conversation with a fertility doctor to get the, the full context. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and another question for Guy, how much does it cost to freeze ovarian tissue? That's often so ovarian tissue freezing um, is simply having a laparoscopy, which is a camera in the tummy button. It's how gallbladders and appendixes are taken out. So the, the procedure takes about 30 to 40 minutes, that's all. And part of the ovary is removed, quite simply. Right. Um, and then in the laboratory, um, very, very thin slices are cut up um, and frozen. And so you can generally, if it's for uh, cancer preservation, you can generally get that done, and that was to be done through the public system. Okay. Um, but there would be no um, public funding for that, for the ovarian tissue freezing, and that would be about four and a half thousand dollars. And a question for Caroline. Caroline, um, what would you do differently if you were doing this again? Oh, so much of it is beyond your control. Um, I guess I may, well, go, definitely going into the IVF in the second round, I would have looked around more um, to different clinics, spoken to different people about it. Because since um, going through the rounds I've been through, I've obviously spoken to many women about their experiences and found that um, obviously everybody has a different story, but quite often um, there's a consistent story of people feeling unsupported and um, having difficulties in, in availability, etc., of being able to talk to the right people at the right time. So I would look around where I'd talk to people, and I'd be more well informed about the idea of processing the, the services available, different clinics available, before I um, went into another round. How much choice do people have in the public sector, Dan? So there's no choice in the public sector. Mm -hmm. 
Um, if you, so separate to fertility preservation, if you need IVF for a fertility reason, um, you would be randomly allocated to one of the three clinics that often provide government funds for IVF. Yeah. And for fertility preservation, because it's so urgent, um, it's generally allocated on month of birth. So if you're born in December, you always go to that particular clinic. February is that particular clinic. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was referring to my private yeah. second round. Yeah. Uh, question for Sheridan. I read that some of the chemotherapy treatments can weaken the heart, which can affect pregnancy after cancer. Which chemotherapy treatment is that? Mm -hmm. So there's two main classes of drugs that can impact on the heart. Um, one is Herceptin, but that's generally a reversible phenomenon. So when you stop the drug, the heart dysfunction returns to normal. The other class of drugs are the anthracyclines. They're the drugs that are often read in the bag, um, epiluvacin and adriamycin. The impact on the heart from those drugs tends to occur some years down the track, so not soon after the time of chemotherapy. Um, and Guy, um, another question. I was told there was a lower chance of successful pregnancy from frozen eggs as opposed to embryos. Is that the case. I don't think it is now. Um, as I said, the last four to five years, the technique by which we're frozen eggs has changed. We now freeze eggs and embryos in exactly the same way. It's called stack freezing and it avoids it. It basically avoids ice crystals form. Um, and we're now getting um, very commonly uh, around the world very similar outcomes. You do need a reasonable number of eggs frozen to give yourself a reasonable chance of having a baby. It would be in the order of 7 to 10 eggs um, because you probably need about 7 to 10 eggs to on average get about two good quality day by plasticizers. Mm -hmm. okay. It's not, not all eggs fertilised. Yeah. Not all fertilised eggs grow on to become normal embryos. And probably, you know, without scaring people, probably around 35 or 36 years of age is where the number of genetically abnormal eggs starts to creep up. And so miscarriage risk is more common than things like that. And this question might feed into that. I had IVF done before my treatment started with 18 eggs frozen. I'm amazed with that result. Since I've been treatment, everything has stopped working. I'm hoping it will start up again. If it doesn't, can I still have all the IVF to try for a baby? I guess that was IVF before breast cancer. Yeah, so certainly the frozen eggs can be used, and it doesn't matter if she's not having periods because we can pull the worm into thinking that population's happening despite by estrogen and progesterone tablets. So that's why women in their 50s can have babies because the worm doesn't get old, it's the ovaries. So we can, we can certainly pull out her eggs, fertilise them, make an embryo, and then put one of those back. But if her periods haven't come back, after chemotherapy, it's unlikely, I mean, a, a blood test will help confirm it, but it's unlikely she'd be able to do further IVF using her mm -hmm. But she certainly could use her stored ones. Yeah. Right, and this is a um, related question maybe for you, Sheridan. I'm 35 and had breast cancer 10 years ago, didn't have IVF at the time. My natural fertility hasn't returned yet. Could it still come back at some stage? You know, I'm hoping. I may have a perspective on this as well, but I think that's unlikely. Um, that's, uh, I, I certainly have never heard of that happening, unfortunately. You generally have um, a return of the signs of fertility quite soon after chemotherapy, if that's going to be your experience. Yeah, yeah. Which you think right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, an AMH blood test, if it was undetectable or very low, would fit with her unfortunately not having periods, so it would mean that she is she is going to have to look at options like that or if, if, if that's for consideration. Right. Because some people don't want to consider that or And it, it can be misleading if people are taking tamoxifen because that can interrupt having normal periods even though it might not reflect what their ovarian reserve is because of the other effects on the endometrium from tamoxifen. So um, if someone has failed to have a return of their periods, but they're taking tamoxifen, it might not be interpreted the same way. And is there any reason an oncologist wouldn't recommend the ovary-preserving drug during chemo? 
Uh, yes, there is some reason. So one of the main studies that was done was called the POLI study, and that trial uh, in which there was around about 275 patients, that was restricted to people who had hormone receptor negative disease. So our greatest confidence in using that drug is in the hormone receptor negative population, but some of the other studies have included hormone receptor positive breast cancer cases. So um, it's the most common use is in hormone receptor negative uh, breast cancers, but again it needs to be individualized, so it's worth discuss discussing and, and explicitly asking that question with an oncologist. Do you think I'm a candidate for the injection that might protect my ovaries? And uh, when, when would you tell them it's time to stop trying? Um, so what we know is that um, a lot of the chances of getting pregnant from IVF is embryo quality. So if someone has two or three attempts to stimulate the ovary with drugs and we're not getting eggs, or we're getting one or two eggs that they don't, don't fertilise and become embryos, we're generally going to say to them that their chances are probably one or two percent, and most people want to carry on when they're one or two percent. Um, we know that we generally only put one single embryo back these days. We used to put three back, and I started putting five years ago. But um, as we've got better at looking after embryos in the laboratory, the pregnancy rates went up, and we ended up with two and twenty. Mm -hmm. So in New Zealand now, we put one embryo back, probably in about 95% of women under 40. And generally, the first four or five embryos that you have put back have got a pretty much equal chance of working. So just because the first two or three haven't worked doesn't mean the fourth or the fifth might not. It's unusual in New Zealand for people to carry on after three or four drug cycles. Um, the government funding can do two, and um, and people will sometimes pay for one. So, yeah, just, just the emotional burden of it and also the financial burden. Mm -hmm. But we've all had patients who've got pregnant after their night for their 10th embryo back. Yeah. Right. And Caroline, how are you finding the process of looking at adoption and other? Oh, well, um, it's just another difficult process. Um, we're just starting out on the journey of considering adoption. And again, it's a long process, um, <coughs> uncertain outcome, and an expensive one because uh, locally there are very few babies that you can adopt. So adopting in New Zealand is um, you've got less chance of getting a child in New Zealand than you have winning the lotto. I think mm -hmm. was the joke that was said recently mm -hmm. to me. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you're going to adopt internationally, of course, there's a lot of cost involved and there's a lot of uncertainty in terms of timing and whether you will actually um, be successful or not. And there are different options. It's publicly funded um, through what was known as SIPs, um, Child Visa and Family, um, or there are um, other uh, private options available. So it, it is a difficult process, but it's certainly one that's well worthwhile checking out. And there's not just adoption, there is home for life, which is where the child is not given up by the parents for adoption, but they are uh, taken away from their parents for various different reasons, and you're able to raise that child uh, in your family, but not legally adopt that child. So there's different options, in addition to fostering, etc. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, and a, a compliment for Sheridan. I had triple negative inflammatory breast cancer, um, and then had Zolodex, treated by Dr. Sheridan Wilson, um, had Zolodex injections. Um, it's truly saved my egg was there, so big thank you, Dr. Wilson. I'm about to start IVF in November. Oh, best of luck. Yeah, yay. Um, how long after finishing treatment should you get a blood test to check ovarian levels? I had my FSH levels tested three months after finishing chemo, they came in super high. I'm sorry, could you? Um, how long after finishing treatment should you get a blood test to check ovarian levels? <coughs> Had my FSH levels tested three months after finishing chemo, it came in super high. So there are some challenges in interpreting those levels if you're on endocrine therapy, so that would need to be um, considered. And it is true that the 
effective chemotherapy can be temporary. So sometimes we tell people to wait a couple of years before we're sure um, whether or not they're going to have a return of their regular um, menstrual periods. The AMH levels may surpass that uh, historical sort of approach though. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think definitely um, well worth waiting at least a year. Um, but again, we, we think AMH probably doesn't recover. Um, it can, it's, it's worth noting that it can be artificially reduced if um, someone's on the oral contraceptive. Um, and so if we do an AMH in someone um, who may be just 28 or 30 and wanting to know about their fertility for the future, if it's a bit lower than on the pill, we'll get them to stop the pill for three months and repeat it. And we do sometimes get bounced up. But it's pretty unusual to see someone who's got a low AMH from um, you know, cancer therapy and then for it to bounce back. Whereas an EPSH can be up. It's a brain hormone that, that we used to use to measure fertility but not nearly as accurate, and that can be elevated because of the drugs and then drop down and we start working again. So yeah, AMH is probably the more useful and it's very reasonable to wait a whole year at least. Okay. And do you know if the government would pay for IVF with thawed eggs and donor sperm if you don't have a partner? Yes. Okay. If I didn't freeze eggs before commencing chemo, would I be entitled to public funding now that I have completed chemo but I'm not in a position to start a family yet, age 33? Um, no. So facility preservation funding currently has to be prior to the treatment right. <laughs> and, 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 the, and the, probable, um, the probable insult to the fertility. To the but could she go on a regular waiting list for publicly funded? Not if she's current, not if she hasn't been tried. So one of the eligibility criteria for the general funding is that it that a person's been trying for twelve months to get free. Okay, but then she could go on a regular waiting list to uh, if she can try for twelve months and if she had enough points of point scoring system. Right, right. Okay. Um, I've been told to wait two years before trying for pregnancy post-cancer treatment. What percent of risk is there for recurrence if I become pregnant sooner than two years? We, we, can't, we don't know um, is the answer. Uh, there simply isn't data to tell us uh, that a pregnancy within those two years increases your risk by a certain amount. So I'm really sorry that there, there just isn't information to answer that. I think we might already cover this one. How many tries do you get for IVF before the funding is stopped? So um, you get two packages of care, and the package is, is an IVF cycle. If you're up at your first IVF cycle, and it includes any frozen embryos, um, is successful if it results in the baby, then you cannot do the second cycle. So the answer is two, but only one of the first one works. If you do get a baby at the moment, you can come back and use any spare frozen one for free as well. So you do have the chance for two babies under those circumstances. Once you have two babies, there's no public funding. So what do you mean you can have a second one for free? Um, so you can do an idea of cycle, have an embryo put back and get pregnant and have a baby. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's a frozen one that's put back and it's successful. You might still have three or four frozen ones. So you can come back when the baby's a year or two old and have those frozen ones back for free because they were generated as part of your right. cycle. Okay, great. Um, and what about breastfeeding after breast cancer? Is that the so obviously not while you're on any hormone therapies. Um, most women who have had so Breastfeeding from the unaffected breast is fine, not a problem and it shouldn't be affected. Breastfeeding from a breast that has undergone a partial mastectomy or radiotherapy um, is frequently not possible, generally because milk production is dramatically lowered in those breasts. But there certainly are examples of it happening. But in the unaffected breast, breastfeeding should be able to proceed without um, any instruction. And what if my breast cancer comes back um, while I'm pregnant? 
So we can treat breast cancer during pregnancy. Um, surgery is an option um, and chemotherapy can also be an option during pregnancy. We are restricted in what kinds of drugs we can use and we have to be careful about the timing of delivery and the timing of chemotherapy doses. So often a woman who need cancer treatment, not just <coughs> breast cancer treatment, but cancer treatment during pregnancy will often have a planned uh, delivery at around 38 weeks to just give some certainty around the timing of the chemotherapy doses and the delivery of, of the baby. Um, but it's, it is possible to provide some breast cancer treatment during pregnancy. Okay. And how much does private IVF cost? It costs approximately $10,000 or simple IVF and if you need microinjection, which was the slide I showed in the end being injected with the firm, it's about an extra two thousand dollars. So that's about twelve if you need XC. And about half of people need XC if there's a sperm And um, what about genetic tests and um, that's about three and a half thousand dollars at the moment. Um, for however many many embryos, it might be one embryo, it might be six or seven. Mm -hmm. um, within a year or two or two it'll, it'll be per embryo. Um, in probably hundred thousand dollars, so probably eight or nine hundred dollars per year. Is that testing done here in New Zealand? In Auckland. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then what about the Great. Okay. Well, huge thank you to everyone. Who, um, at home who has watched tonight and I understand we have one or two sound glitches so I'm sorry about that. There will be um, a recording on the website that you can watch. We'll let you know about that in a few days. Um, thanks again to Caroline, Sheridan and Guy. We hope that you all found this helpful and we'd appreciate if you could take time to give your feedback when you exit the webinar. If tonight's discussion has raised any questions or concerns for you, please do call our Breast Cancer Foundation nurses, Sarah and Vivian. They'll be on our OH100 BC nurse line tomorrow, and that number is on the screen now. Um, as well as answering questions, our nurses can provide referrals to our free counselling service and to fund the rehabilitation program. Um, so we'll send you a link to that recording when it's online. If you'd like to watch it again, we'll recommend it to someone else. Thanks again for joining us. Good night.